Like the Battle of Cowpens, the Battle of Trenton was a small but significant engagement that turned the tide of the American Revolution. By December of 1776, Washington had been decisively defeated in New York and New Jersey. His troops were finally pushed back across the New Jersey-Pennsylvania border, and he'd established a headquarters just south of Trenton across the Delaware River. Now, American morale at this point reached its low, with 90% of Washington's army choosing to desert and return to their homes. As Washington wrote to his cousin, I think the game is pretty near up. The British also began to become more lax, feeling that they could, as soon as the winter was over, shift to a mopping up operation to eliminate isolated pockets of resistance. Now on December 26, 1776, Trenton was garrisoned by about 1,500 Hessian troops under Colonel Johann Rahl. As a reminder, the Hessians were German mercenaries hired by the British, and only a small number of British were actually involved in the battle. The Hessians were generally viewed as elite troops who had military experience from fighting in the frequent wars of the 18th century Europe. While Rahl was a seasoned commander with 36 years of experience, his troops found him abrasive and they were not happy to serve under him. Rahl's officers urged him to fortify Trenton against a possible rebel assault, but Rahl dismissed the rebels, stating, Let them come. We will go at them with the bayonet. Using spy John Honeyman, Washington determined that the Hessian defenses were lax, and he decided to make a surprise attack in the middle of winter, hoping for a necessary victory. In addition to the false sense of security of the Hessians, Washington was fortunate to have three of his most capable officers, Nathaniel Green, John Sullivan, and Henry Knox, who acted as his subordinates in the battle. Washington's plan was to send a small force south to block the bridge across Assenpink Creek and stop the retreating Hessians. At the same time, he would cross the Delaware nine miles to the north of Trenton with the bulk of his 2,400 troops. He would split into two forces, one under Sullivan and one under Green, who would make a two-pronged attack from the northwest on Trenton. It was Washington's hope that he could perform this surprise attack in the pre-dawn hours. Now, the night before the attack, Washington gathered up his troops, giving them 60 rounds of ammunition and three days' rations. Now, contrary to Thomas Sully's famous painting, the Durham boats were much larger and the river much smaller than portrayed. Small artillery pieces like this three-pounder, as well as horses, were taken across on ferries. Because of the weather, the crossing went slower than anticipated, and Washington was delayed until 4 a.m. before he could gather his troops for the nine-mile march to Trenton. With dawn coming three hours later, his chances of making an attack before the sun rose were dashed. At 8 a.m., Washington arrived with Green's troops at Trenton, and meanwhile, Sullivan was arriving along the river road to the southwest. As Washington struck, the Hessians poured out of the houses that they were quartered in, and they immediately came under fire. They were forced to retreat southward and did so in good order. Washington then had time to order his units to fan out to the east and cover any escape along Princeton Road. Where the Trenton Battle Monument is today, he placed his artillery with a clear view of the V between King and Queen Streets. Sullivan also moved east to add more coverage to the bridge over Assenpink Creek. In doing so, he met with the resistance by 50 Hessian Jaegers, who fled after a single volley against Sullivan's column. Now, Rawl had three regiments. One he commanded, and one was under Nipphausen, and the other under Lossberg. Rawl gathered his troops on Lower King Street, about where the Warren Street Plaza is today. Lossberg arrayed his forces to the northeast on Queen Street, while Nipphausen stood in reserve to the southeast near the Friends Meeting House. Washington opened up with his artillery, being able to fire easily down both King and Queen Streets on the advancing Hessians, and Rawl ordered his men to set up three-pound guns to fire north on King Street. But after getting off only six rounds, the Hessian artillery crews were slaughtered. It was now Washington's turn to advance down King Street and take the Hessian guns. The Hessian troops attempted to retreat to the southwest, where they were quickly confronted by Sullivan's column, and then they fled to the east. Now, Nipphausen's troops also separated from their commander's forces, and they retreated eastward. Rawl was finally able to rally his disorganized troops and again attempted to take Washington's initial position at the top of the V from the east. However, because of Sullivan's troops firing from the south and Washington's troops firing from the north and east, the Hessians were caught in a withering crossfire. Despite this, they were bravely able to retake one of their cannons for a brief period. Their attack then stalled, and after Rawl was mortally wounded, the advance turned into a rout eastward. Washington led his troops down from the high ground, yelling, March on, my brave fellows, after me! Surrounded in an orchard with their commander dying, the Hessians chose to surrender, and just minutes later, Nipphausen's lost regiment was surrounded by Sullivan's men and also surrendered. The Hessians lost 22 killed, including Rawl, 
83 wounded, and a whopping 896 soldiers captured. The Americans suffered only two deaths and five wounded, including future President James Madison, who incurred a serious shoulder wound in the fighting. Beyond the casualties, Washington really gained four advantages from the victory at Trenton. First, the spoils of the captured Hessian garrison included arms, ammunition, food, bedding, and much-needed shoes and clothing. Also, the defeat of the Hessians cooled the ardor for further German mercenaries to join the British cause. Third, in the next few months, Loyalists would again rally to the rebel cause, and the American ranks again began to swell. And finally, foreign powers such as France and Spain began to take the American movement as a more serious threat to their old enemy, the English, and aid began to trickle into the colonists. So this much-needed victory turned the course of the war in the American Revolution's central region, and it also led to Washington's establishment as a military commander to be reckoned with. So Hold the Line came out in 2008, and it was published by Worthington Games. Its designers were Matt Birchfield, Grant Wiley, and Mike Wiley. And it's really a redevelopment of an earlier game, Clash for Continent, made by the same designers. And Clash for Continent came out in 2005. And interestingly, the game was somewhat influenced by the Command and Colors type of games, which are heavily influenced by miniature wargaming. Now, in 2017, Compass Games would come out with Command & Colors Tricorn, which is somewhat similar to Hold the Line. It uses cards instead of dice to activate units. Let's run through the rules a little bit. If you look at the map board, it's divided into terrain, and you use hex tiles to indicate terrain. And terrain affects movement, combat, and morale checks. And you can look over the terrain effects table to kind of get an idea of what terrain does. Now, certain types of terrain like forest and hills, towns, entrenchments, all can block line of sight. I don't quite follow the rules as written in this. I think they're a little bit wonky. But when I talk about line of sight, I'll talk about that a little bit more. Units are kind of interesting. They represent infantry, artillery, cavalry, which they call dragoons in this game, and leaders. And their respective armies. The uh, blue indicate the colonial troops which will include the French and the Americans. And the salmon-colored ones in indicate the British and British-aligned troops, like the Hessians. Each unit has an icon to identify the unit type and a flag to designate its base nationality. There's also regular, elite, and light units, and that's shown down in the corner here. And next to this is a morale point. This is kind of the hit point for the unit. And this game assumes that when a unit takes damage, it's not necessarily killed or wounded. It also indicates a morale loss, which would cause units to leave the field of battle if it reached zero. Now an E next to the morale number represents elite infantry, and an LT next to the morale represents light infantry. Artillery, dragoons, militia, and leader units are on a smaller square counter. As units take damage, you flip them over to lower the morale point. And so a unit can go from four to three, and then you can replace this with a two unit and then flip it over for a one unit. Also, each unit has a set movement rate that remains constant throughout the game. So regular infantry represent the basic forces of the armies, and they're on long rectangular counters, and the unit size is three to four morale points, and its normal movement is one hex per turn. The elite infantry represent the uh, crack infantry units of the armies, and you can tell the unit by the E next to the morale points. The special thing about an elite unit is that when it gets down to one morale point and it's hit, it's allowed to roll one die per hit to determine if that hit's applied. Let's say that this elite infantry unit is down to two hit die, and the attacker rolls a, uh, a four, five, and six. And, and let's say that in this case, the five or six would be hits on the elite infantry unit. So basically, the five roll would bring the elite's morale down to one, and then the six, which would be a hit, would cause the elite unit to roll to see if that hit took effect. So if they rolled a one, two, or three, there'd be no effect. And if they rolled a four, five, or six, then that means that the elite unit would have to take the hit and be eliminated. Now, elite units always start out with four morale points. And again, their normal movement rate is one hex per turn. They also receive a plus one modifier on all morale checks. Light infantry represent forces that are developed for speed, and light units are on the long rectangular infantry counter with the LT next to the unit's morale points. Light infantry start with three morale points, and their normal movement rate is up to two hexes per turn. There's also, on the small square counters, there's militia infantry, and these are the raw recruits, the locals who came to fight, and the uh, general made-up forces that are thrown together at the last minute. 
They're gray or blue for the American militia and they're brown for the British Tory militia. Their unit size is two morale points and their normal rate of movement is one hex per turn. Dragoons, which represent the cavalry present the battle, are also on the smaller square counters. Their unit size is two morale points and their normal movement rate is up to three hexes per turn. Now dragoons may either move or fire for one action point expended. And if they want to spend two action points, then they can move and fire. However, they cannot fire and then move. And dragoons are not allowed to initiate close combat. Artillery are simply your cannons that are present at the battle. And artillery units are on the small square counters. Their morale points are two and their movement rate is one hex per turn. And like dragoons, they're not allowed to initiate close combat. However, they do have the ability to fire a little further than other units. Leaders are helpful in keeping unit morale up, and for the expenditure of one action point, their normal movement rate is up to three hexes per turn. However, leaders can move with the unit they're attached to for no additional expenditure of action points. And with the expenditure of one action point, leaders have the unique ability to rally damaged infantry or dragoon units. And also for the expenditure of one action point, a leader can allow infantry type units and dragoons that they're stacked with to exceed their normal movement rate by one additional hex. There are also some victory point counters which represent specific locations or supplies or objectives that have to be captured, destroyed, or obtained in a game. And they're only earned when you take them from the opposing player. Stacking is usually one unit per hex However, artillery units can stack with a single dragoon or infantry unit without exceeding the hex limit. And leaders can be placed freely in any hex with any other units without exceeding hex limits. The game sequence is pretty easy. The, the first player as determined by the scenario rolls and determines their random action points available, and they add this to their command action points for their total action points per turn. They then perform their actions, and, and they can do this in any order they want. They can move, they can fire, they can perform close combat, or they can rally. Then the second player rolls and determines their random action points available and adds this to the command action points for their total. They then perform any actions that they want. Again, it's move, fire, perform close combat, or rally. And then you have the end of the turn and move the, and move the turn marker forward one. So let's go to the first phase, the action point determination phase. Action points determine how many things you can do in a uh, turn. Now each scenario starts out with a number of command action points for each side. And during each turn, you roll a d3, and you add that random number to the command action points to get the total number of action points that you can use in that turn. And each action point allows each side to move, perform combat, or in the case of leaders, rally units. Each unit can only perform one action per turn. So, if, for instance, a unit could not attack and then wait and use another action point to move, or vice versa. And you simply keep track of your action points on your action point track. Now, most actions cost one action point. The exception to this is close combat, which costs two action points to initiate. And as I said earlier, your dragoons can move or fire for an action point, or they can uh, move and fire for two action points, and they can never conduct close combat. Also, any unit except artillery stacked with a leader can move one additional hex over its normal movement rate for the expenditure of one additional action point. In other words, two action points to move two hexes. Now these units do have to begin and end their turn with the leader, and they cannot conduct fire or close combat during the turn if they use this option. Also, as I mentioned before, leaders that start the turn in the same hex as a friendly combat unit can move with that unit without expending any additional action turns. In other words, they travel along with the unit, and the unit expends one action point to move. Now stacking is fairly severe in this game, you, with the exception of artillery and leader units like I talked about above. Units cannot enter or move through a hex that contains another unit, whether it's friendly or an enemy unit. And if a leader is left alone in a hex and an enemy unit moves into that hex, then that leader is eliminated. So further, if it was, say, a light infantry or a dragoon, it wouldn't have to stop. It could continue to move after eliminating that leader. There are two types of combat in this game. There's fire combat and close combat. Let's talk about fire combat first. To conduct fire combat, the player expends an action point, they determine the range and the hit numbers, and then they roll three dice, and they modify the final hit number rolled on each die dependent on terrain. It sounds a little bit complicated, but it gets easy when you break it down. Now, the number of dice in this game never change. Regardless of the number of morale points, no matter what they are, each unit rolls three dice. Then they score a hit if the dice rolled is equal to or greater than the hit number. 
and looking at this table you can kind of see what they are. So let's start here with infantry. If a enemy is say one hex away, they roll their three dice and on a five or a six they would get a hit. If the enemy was two hexes away they would need to roll a six. And so if they rolled a, a one, five, and six, if the enemy was one hex away, they would get two hits on the enemy. Now you can see that the dragoons can only hit one hex away and artillery can hit up to three hexes away. Now, as I mentioned above, you flip the unit to indicate the loss of morale points. And if you reach zero, then that unit is eliminated. Unless it's an elite infantry in which it can make saving throws to prevent morale loss. If two units are in a targeted hex, then hits are applied to the highest value unit, and in ties the owning player decides the unit to be hit. Line of sight's a little bit different in this game, and I don't necessarily follow the rules as written. Terrain that can block line of sight are forest, hills, town, entrenchments, and units. However, I say if a unit is in a forest, in a hill, in a town, and being shot upon, then line of sight is not blocked. However, the units that are in that type of uh, protective terrain do get a modifier to the attacking die roll. Also, these units can fire out of entrenchments, towns, hills, and forests without any sort of uh, penalty. Now, if the line of sight falls along a hex side, then the line of sight is blocked if both hexes adjacent to the hex side have the blocking terrain. Now, if only one hex side has blocking terrain, then the line of sight is clear and the unit can fire. The second type of combat is close combat. Only infantry units can conduct close combat, and they have to be adjacent to the unit that they're going to melee with. It costs two action points to declare close combat, and during close combat, all defending units, other than leaders and victory point units in the hex, roll one six-sided die per unit before the attacker rolls for the close combat hit. And this is a morale check. And if the die is higher than the unit's current morale points, adjusted for a leadership and terrain bonus, then the unit fails their morale roll and they retreat one hex after the close combat. Not during, but after the close combat. Now, a natural roll of six always means a retreat, regardless of any morale modifiers. And any leaders that are stacked with retreating units also have to retreat. So after making the morale check, the attacker then rolls to see how much damage their close attack does. And again, they have to apply any terrain modifiers to the hit numbers rolled. The advantage to close combat is it allows an infantry attacker to hit a targeted unit on a modified 4, 5, or 6. Otherwise, if, say, you were firing on a unit, the best you could do was hit on a 5 or 6. Also remember that elite units add plus 1 to their morale check for close combat retreats. After the defending unit takes its damage, if it has failed the morale check, it has to retreat. And they generally retreat towards the side of the board as represented in the uh, scenario. Now, if a unit is unable to retreat because the retreat path is blocked by terrain, board edges, or enemy units, then they are eliminated. But retreating units can end up in a hex adjacent to an enemy unit. Now, if a friendly unit blocks a unit's retreat, then the friendly unit must also retreat to make room for the retreating unit. And only one unit can be displaced to make room for a retreating unit. If more than one unit would need to be displaced to give a retreating unit an opening, then the retreating unit is eliminated instead. Now, when an infantry and artillery are stacked together and a morale check is made due to close combat, the infantry checks their morale first. And if they pass, then the artillery is considered to have passed also. If they fail, the artillery must make a separate morale check to see if they also retreat. And leaders always add a plus one modifier to morale for retreat determination to all the units that are in the hex with them. Now, every time a one is rolled by an attacker during fire or close combat and the defender has a leader in their hex, the leader must roll one die to see if they were eliminated by rolling a d6. And on a second one, the leader is eliminated. So in other words, if a one is rolled and the defender rolls a second one on a die six, then that leader would be killed. And when a leader is eliminated, the command action points are reduced by one for the rest of the game. And finally, leaders can rally all units except artillery that have suffered a reduction in morale points due to combat. And to rally, a unit has to begin and end its turn in the same hex with the leader, and the unit and the leader may not move during the turn. It costs one action point to recover one morale point, and you can only recover one morale point maximum per turn per unit. Now, each scenario has a number of victory points. Generally, one victory point is awarded for every enemy unit that is eliminated, and one victory point is awarded for every victory point counter that's obtained, captured, or destroyed. Also, there's generally time constraints in the game. These are printed in the scenario, and one side has to obtain enough victory points by a certain number of turns, or they lose the scenario. 
Again, these rules sound a little bit complicated, but they're really not. This is a pretty easy game to learn and play. So, so let's go through, and we are going to play the Battle of Trenton today. Okay, so this is Trenton. Uh, we can see here is the, uh, I guess, the Delaware River and the creek going over here, maybe. And here's the bridge. And then these little uh, town hexes are, I guess, the town of Trenton. We've got Green, who probably should be more up here with Washington and Sullivan. This should probably be Sullivan, but we'll live with it. Uh, Washington has troops to the north, and uh, Sullivan would have his troops here to the west. And then Rawl is stationed right here. I guess this is where the V, at King, where King and King, Queen Streets come together on this hill here. And then uh, the rest of the Hessian forces are over here. I'm not sure why these are... Uh, elite forces, but we'll live with it. Okay, um, a couple special rules for this uh, particular scenario. On turns one through five, the British receive one command action point, and then after turn five, the British will receive two act command points. Uh, also, the British receive two victory points for every three units that they're able to exit across the bridge, so they're going to have a hard time trying to race for that bridge while the Americans are going to try to cut them off, which is pretty close to what happened with the real battle. Um, and the Americans get a victory point if they can get down to this victory point marker and hold it. So victory conditions, 20 tur it's a 22-turn it's a game, and uh, six victory points for the Americans that they need to get. Uh, let's see. Six. And if the, if the British can make it to 22 turns and avoid that or get six victory points themselves, then they win. That's pretty much it. Let's get it set up. Now, the one thing I do that's a little different than rules as written is on line of sight rules. I say that these units can be targeted that are in the town or forest or anything. I'm, I don't make everything impenetrable fortresses. So um, basically what would happen is there would be a, if a unit is shooting in to a town, they have a minus one to hit, but they can still hit units that are in town. Uh, however, towns, forest, hills would still block line of sight if they're trying to shoot past that. So that's just a little, I'm kind of following the what other war games do. I think that makes a little more sense. Okay, let's go ahead and uh, play. Americans get first turn. And we roll for the first turn. They get a plus three. So they are here at six. I'm going to move this over a little bit. And... Uh, so they have six action points to use. And what I think I'll do is I'm going to go ahead and move uh, Sullivan's units over here into place. So one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Okay, those guys have moved. And then I'm going to move these guys. I'm going to move... Um, that cannon into place here. Okay, that's it for the American turn. They just they just moved. Okay, we go. Let me put my turn marker down here. That's whoever did the uh, the uh, vassal module on this did a pretty good job. Okay, we're at the British phase. We're gonna flip our marker and we're gonna roll for action points. And um, the British get plus one, so they get this is where they started with one since it's the first turn. And they're going to have two action points. What are they going to do? I think we're going to go ahead and fight over here. I could try to move this guy. I wonder, that'd be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight turns to get down to that bridge. Ugh, that's a long ways. Or we could try to move this guy. One, two, three, four, five, six turns. I think we'll do that. So we're going to move one here two here. Oh, that's it. Okay. So we flip our marker. We go to our next turn and we get action points for the Americans. They get a plus one. So they have four. Um, we're going to go one. Oh, yeah. Move this here. I just like how that looks better. Oops. Okay, there's one, two, three, four. Okay, I'm going to shoot with these 
one, uh, two. I'm going to use this. I'm going to move. I'm going to fire with that cannon there. So to go one hex uh, requires a, you get a, to fire one hex, it's a four, five, or six, but he's in a town, so it's going to be either a five or six. So I fire and get a six. Okay. So he takes a hit. So that was one, two. And I've got two more. I'm going to go with these guys. I want to, I'm going to weaken these down before I try to do a close combat. Okay, so those two are going to go. That'll be the end of my turn. So we fire up the cannon, and I get a four. So that's going to take a hit, and then I need a five or six, and I get a six. Okay, hit taken, hit taken. That's it. Okay, we can go to the next turn. Or the next phase, I guess. Flip marker, it's the British phase. They roll for... Th okay, they get a few more action points this time. So they have four action points to spend. They're going to move him one. Um, I'm going to fire with him towards green. If I can hit green and take him out, that would be helpful. Um, let's see. So he rolls a three and oh one two three so three hits for these guys hit taken hit taken hit taken and then green has to save make a saving throw three times if they get to one he's killed okay nope didn't save now i'm not sure whether i forget whether it's a six or a one that kills him it doesn't matter just give him a one in six chance and you're cool just be consistent okay there is our mark moved here so two guys have moved. Um, let's go against here. Let's do that. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to try to use a... Uh, I'm going to use two points, two action points, and do a close combat. So first we see those guys get to save to see if, they're, if they retreat after battle. So if they get a five or six, they retreat. Nope, they don't. Okay, and then... We roll a d3, and it's a 4, 5, or 6 on a close combat. Two hits. Okay. Hit taken. Hit taken. Mark moved. And that is going to be it. Okay. So we flip our thing here. Flip. Come on. You flip. Okay. Go to our next uh, turn. Turn 3. We roll our APs for the Americans, and they get plus 2, so they have 5 APs. Okay, I'm going to fire here with cannon first, so they get, uh, they need a four, five, or six, and there it is, there's one, hit taken, I'll fire with a uh, infantry, they need a five or six, and that is enough to eliminate him. Okay, so we moved to, I forget what we had. Do we have six? Oh, we had plus one. Nope. The Americans had a plus one, so they had a plus one, and they did with two. Okay. I swear when I... My throat gets to tickle in me whenever I do recording for some reason. Some sort of weird condition response. Okay, two. I think we're going to fire in on these guys. So these two are going to both go, and that'll be the end of my turn. So the cannon will go with a four, five, or six. Plus minus one, since he's in a town. So five or six. Nothing. Okay, and then the other guy will go. He needs sixes. Nothing. Okay. Nothing and nothing. So we're going to go, we'll f flip our marker. We're going to go to our next British phase. This is the third British phase, and they get plus three, so they have four action points. So what should the British do? Let's see. I've got four units to do it. Um, 
Washington's still on these hillside. Now hillsides are 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 trying are have a uh, minus one, so those aren't the best. Um, I think I'll wait for the British to come to me. I suppose I could try shooting here. I could shoot out and try to take that cannon down. That might be. Let's try to do that. So I'm going to to go here and I'm going to shoot one. So we shoot into there and they got a three, four and four. Now they would need a five. So they don't do anything. Then these guys over here, these elite troops are going to go. And I think I'll go ahead and try to uh, push these guys back. Oh, I know. Forgot this guy. There we go. Now, I could get a shot in on green here. Or I could attack here. I could do both. Okay, let's just, we're going to shoot into this one. So I need fives and sixes. I got two sixes, which eliminates the uh, continental group here. And then finally, I'm going to shoot over here towards green. And I need three. Okay, so I needed five or six to here. I needed sixes to hit. So I hit with one. So it eliminates this guy. And then green gets to save. They took one hit. And so he made a five. So he he survives it. Okay, and that was it. Okay. Flip it. And we're going to go to uh, turn four. American APs are going to be five. What are we going to do? We're going to try to blast those guys. Let's move green out of the way. And uh, let's see. I think leaders can move. I'm sure leaders can move too. So let's move him here. And we'll move him here. So there's two. I gotta cut this guy off. That's my next thing. Um, let's see, this would be five, six. Oh, he can't do anything there. So there's three, four. And I guess we'll we'll try to shoot with the cannon in here. Now normally that would be a four, five, six, but it's gonna just be a five, six since he's in town. And he gets a six. Okay, that gives him a hit. And that will be the end of turn, or end of the round, phase, I guess they call it for this. Flip marker, we'll go to the next uh, British phase. British has have an, the British have an AP of plus one, so they have two. Again, we'll move this guy, and then we'll fire here. Okay, got a six. Now the six will go with whoever's the highest. Since there's two different units here, since artillery is stacked, uh, that kind of protects artillery a little bit. And that's the end of the British phase. Flip our marker. Go to American phase, actually end of turn. And sign the APs for the action points for the Americans. They have four this round. Okay. Uh, one, two, and I just realized I had a leader stacked and I was using that as a single point, but I think the leaders can drag them with them, can't they? I'll have to look. I'm For this game, I'm just going to say the leaders can drag a unit with them. So, we'll say one. Next game, I might play it different. I'm going to be doing all of the battles here the of the Southern Campaign, and I'll be comparing Tricorn, the Command and Colors system game, with uh, Hold the Line for about five different Southern Campaign battles. So let's move this guy here. Now, that's two. I know that's two. That makes sense. And then I can move or fire with one. Let's fire right in here. So we need a five or six with the cannon. Nothing. Okay. That's the end. Okay. Flip the marker. 
and we go to our British phase, give them their APs. Oh, and this is turn five. So now we have, since this is uh, turn five, the British now have two action points to begin with. So they are now at two, three, four, five. Okay, that makes them a lot more powerful. We'll move him here. We'll move him here. And then we will attack here. I think we'll attack here. We'll fire. We're going to fire into that group. So that's an action point. And we roll three. And we get a six. Okay. So again, it goes with the one with the higher number of uh, morale points. So three and two. Okay, I got two left. Um, I'm going to use this cannon here. I'm going to fire right down this hex side. So this is uh, four, five, six, five, six. Two hits. Okay. Hit taken and hit taken. So we'll go with those guys. And then I've got one left, and I'm going to use these guys to fire. And they have a five or six. Misses. Okay. End of turn. Flip this. And roll for action points for the Americans. They get a plus one. Okay. We're going to first of all attack here. So one attack here. I, I don't know. I think I'd like to wait. I want a 50-50 chance of pushing him back. And, well... Now, if I push him back, I could push him over here, which would block him from the bridge, because he can move out. I think I'm going to actually have to. So we're going to do a close combat here. So first of all, we're going to roll for morale for the British. Now, they have to get, if they get a five or six, they fail their morale check. They do not, so they stand their line. And then the uh, Americans will attack. No attacks. They would need a four, five, or six, and they don't. So that is it. And that cost them two. And then I'll use my other two right here. I'm going to fire with the cannon, and then I'll fire with uh, the troops. So that'll be it. So we'll fire with the cannon first. And they need a five or six because these guys are in town. Uh, they get two. That is enough. So these guys are eliminated. It still gives me one other attack. I'll just fire, well, I'll do the same thing here. I'll fire with my cannon. And they get one. Okay. We'll flip our guy. We will go to a British phase, turn six British phase. We roll for APs and they get three. They're rolling pretty good this game. I don't know. I'm trying to decide whether, like I say, whether I like this or Command and Colors better. They're both fun. I mean, they're light. Historical accuracy is pretty terrible for both of them. I think Command and Colors maybe has a little bit better, but I don't know. And then you have the difference between the action points and the cards. In Command and Colors, you have the cards. In this, you have action points. Um... I kind of like the action points better because you can, not every battle has a center, right, and left flank. Um, it works with Napoleonic and ancient battles, but uh, any battles where you need a lot of maneuverability, I don't think it really stands up so well. So I don't know. Components for both these games are excellent. Uh, the real life components for both are exceptional. And they're both basically kind of min miniature war games that have been able to be mass produced. So, okay, enough of that. Um, oh, I could have charged in there and taken that town, but I don't know whether artillery, it just doesn't seem like artillery should be able to move into a uh, hex that's been vacated. So I'll leave it be. Um, oh, this is the British. Okay. First of all, move him off, and that goes to British victory points here. 
And is that one or two? Let's check our notes here. Two. Okay, they get two victory points. So I wonder if I can clone him. I'll just clone him and put there. Okay. We will move him here. And we will fight here. And we roll the three, two hits. Okay. Hit taken, hit taken. And then I use my cannon to, to shoot down here. I need a f four, five, or six. No, I need a, f let's see, four, five, six, five, six. Okay. And I made a hit. Okay, so the cannon takes a hit, and that, I think, is it for the British. I may have miscounted my units on that one. That's okay. Let's go to the next turn. Uh, we'll roll for APs, and we get plus two. So five. And advance this. Okay, Americans get to go. I think it's time now to move green up. Say so that's one. Uh, we will attack Rawl again with these two. So one, two. Okay. Cannon needs a five or six. Gets a six. Okay. Get taken. And then the colonists need... Uh, sixes nothing okay we'll then start moving forward one and two we'll move washington forward okay end of that's the end of that uh, phase flip our marker go to british phase and hit ap's and we have three okay so I'm going to attack Washington here. I'm going to use Rawl and this, and this elite force here. So let's start with the Washington attack. I need fives and sixes. I did get a hit. And we'll see if Washington gets a two. He needed a one to kill him. So, okay, Rawl is going to attack here. Needs a five and six. Doesn't do it. And then those elites will attack. They do get a six. Okay. And that's the end of the British uh, phase. End of turn. We can go to turn eight, give the Americans their APs, and they have an AP of five. Okay. We'll move one, two, three, four, five. That's it. Okay. Go to the British phase, and the Brits get to go. Flip this, give them their APs. They get plus three. Okay, they've got five, too. They've rolled pretty well for APs in this game. Last time I played this, they got pretty much had their clock clean because of poor AP rolls. Again, we're going to try for Washington. And uh, we roll three. The six hits. Get taken, and Washington will try to save. Gets a two. Okay, so he's okay. Uh, Mark moved here. We will... Uh, I think I'm going to attack with Rawl here. And we'll mark moved, and roll three, and we get a five. Okay, that's enough to take one, so I'll take the these guys. And then we'll roll for these guys. They can win this battle if they can take out this, uh, take out this uh, artillery here. Roll three, they get their five. Okay, that was enough to do it. So, basically, the uh, British won, or the Hessians won the Battle of Trenton. And like I say, I've 
last time I played this, the Americans pretty much cleaned the Hessian's clock. It was a lot like the real battle, but uh, looks like they got that plus two to get that unit across. They got that unit across the bridge off the board, and that helped them out quite a bit. Anyway, that's what I've got for Hold the Line Trenton. It's okay. I don't know if I'm wild about it. I think if I was just going to start playing a game with, you know, a new player, younger players, it might be a lot of fun or just somebody that wants to knock together a battle. If I'm interested in history, probably try to find something else. There is a small Trenton game out there. I need to try to play one of these days, but I haven't got that. Anyway, let's go ahead and after this, we'll look at Tricorn.